Turing 6502, Arithmetic Operations. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. We're making good progress through the playlist. Right. Let's do the math. In this video, we'll look at the arithmetic operations available on the 6502. Once these are done, I'll move on to stack operations, which will include jump to subroutine and return from subroutine. And finally, I'll go over the reset sequence. The arithmetic operations occur here in the arithmetic logic unit. Surprise, surprise. They're all based on the 8-bit adder, which is within the ALU. There are five main instruction types in this class. Add with carry, compare, subtract with carry, increment, and decrement. There's a lot of overlap, so let's start with the add with carry operation. Let's start by looking at how we do addition in decimal. 8 plus 7 is 15. Write down 5, carry 1. Carry 1 plus 1 is 2. Add 3 is 5. No carry. 2 plus 8 is 10. Write 0, carry 1. 1 plus 7 is 8. Add 4 is 12. Write down the 2, carry 1. 1 plus 8 is 9. And finally, 4 plus 2 is 6. Well, we can do the same thing for binary, except we change the rules a little bit. For the decimal number, we have a column representing ones, tens, one hundreds, one thousands, and so forth. But in binary, we're only allowed to use ones and zeros, and the columns correspond to ones, twos, fours, eights, and so forth. Just as we do for decimal numbers, we work on one column at a time. If carry in 0 and both numbers are 0, then the sum 0, so we write 0 and carry 0. If just one of these numbers is 1, then the sum is 1, so we write 1 and carry 0. Instead of writing 2, we write 0 and carry 1, and instead of writing 3, we write 1 and carry 1. And carry effectively has a weight of 2 because it's applied to the next column. Let's have a look at an example. 1 plus 1 is 2, we write 0, carry 1. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1, so we just write 1, no carry. 1 plus 1 is 2, so we write 0, carry 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, so we write 1 and carry 1. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1, so we just write the 1. And finally, 1 plus 0 is 1. Just as we do with decimal, we only concentrate on one column at a time. So now let's have a quick look at this fourth column. We can think of it as having three inputs, the carry, the one in the top line, and the one in the bottom line. These are all in binary, so we can actually make a little lookup table for this. Here are all the possible combinations of these inputs. This same column with three inputs also has two outputs. The sum, which is the one down the bottom, and the carry out, which goes to the next digit. If we're following these rules, we can add these outputs to our table. If you haven't seen a table like this before, I would encourage you to stop and just go through it yourself and make sure that it's correct. Now I want to look at a subsection of this table, A and B in, and carry out. I can see that carry out's only one when both A and B are both one. And it turns out we have a pretty simple gate for doing this. It's called the AND gate. When I apply 5 volts to both inputs, the output's 5 volts. Otherwise, any other combination and the output will be 0. In this case, I just need one AND gate to generate our carry signal. Now, what about the SUM output? I want the SUM output to be 1 only when A and B are different from each other. So when A and B are both 0, I want the output to be 0. When A and B are both 1, I want the output to be 0. But when they're different, I want the output to be 1. Here we can see the properties of an exclusive OR gate. When the two inputs are different, the output's high, or 5 volts. And when the two inputs are the same, the output's 0, or 0 volts. So if I use an AND gate and an exclusive OR gate together, I can actually produce the sum and the carry from two inputs. This is a well-known circuit called a half adder. This is great, except we have a carry input as well. What we can do is treat this as two additions. 
First, we solved the problem inside the brackets, then we add the partial sum to our carry in and get the final result. If I feed the output of one half adder into the input of another half adder, then I have a total of three inputs, and I can produce the correct sum from this. Finally, if I OR together the carry signals from our half adders, I can produce our carry out signal. Using two half adders and an OR gate, I can make a full adder, which takes the three inputs, input A, input B, and carry in, and produces a sum output and a carry out. Now the full adder is the basis of the adder used in the 6502. Remember that there are a number of registers involved in controlling the arithmetic logic unit. There's an accumulator, there's an A input, a B input, and a hold output. Let's start with looking at a single bit of the addition. Bit 0 of the accumulator gets transferred over to bit 0 of the A register. The B register, including B0, is loaded during instruction decode. Then we present bit 0 of A and bit 0 of B to a full adder. For bit 0, the carry in comes from the status register, specifically the carry flag. These are added together, written into the hold register, which then gets transferred back into the accumulator bit 0. For logic operations, we just replicated this for all the bits, but addition is slightly different. We want the carry out from bit 0 to go to the carry in for bit 1. Then we want the carry out from bit 1 to go to the carry in for bit 2. Then we repeat this all the way up to bit 7. This is known as a carry chain, and it's actually one of the things that tends to limit performance in CPUs. Then the carry out from bit 7 we send back to the status register. So if we look at this example, where we add 0110-1101, which is 6D, to 0111, 0101, which is 75 in hexadecimal, we get the answer 1110-0010, which is E2. So let's put these example values into our adder. Presuming our carry in is 0, the first adder will produce the output 0 with carry 1. The second adder will take this carry and produce an output of 1 with 0 carry. And this continues all the way through the chain. There are a total of five flags associated with 8-bit addition. The zero flag, which is set if the output of the addition is zero. The negative flag, which is set if bit seven of the result is set. Carry is used for both carry in and carry out from the addition. But the next flag is a bit tricky. In our previous example, when we added 6D hexadecimal to 75 hexadecimal, we got the answer of E2. This is great for positive numbers, but what if we want to use positive and negative numbers? Let's briefly go over the two's complement representation. This allows us to represent both positive and negative numbers by adding a negative weight to the most significant bit within a number. Then we can just add them as normal. So for an 8 bit byte, we treat the most significant bit, bit 7, as minus 128. The number negative 16 in this representation would be minus 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16, which means the upper four bits are set, which is F0 in hexadecimal. Some of you may be wondering how we convert a positive number to a negative number in two's complement. That's a very good question. It's actually quite straightforward. What we do is we just flip the value in each bit position. So zeros become ones, and ones become zeros. Then we just add one to the result, and there you have it. You may wonder how we handle the number zero. Well, we negate it to become FF, then add one, which turns it back into zero. So the two's complement of zero is zero. So how do we negate a number like 16? Well, we start off with the hexadecimal value, which is one zero. We negate it, which becomes EF. We add 1, and the result is F0. This means if we're using 2's complement, there's actually a problem with the addition we did before. If we convert these values into decimal, we see that 109 plus 117 equals minus 30. What's happened is that the additions overflowed.
and we can actually detect this just by looking at the top bit, and the ALU in the 6502 actually tells us when this has occurred. We can see that adding two positive numbers has given us a negative number. Let's have a look at how we generate the overflow flag. The first thing to consider is that when we add a positive number with a negative number, the result is always going to be within range. Similarly, when we add a negative number to a positive number, the result of that will also be in range. The problem occurs when we either add two positive numbers to get a negative number, or we add two negative numbers to get a positive number. This occurs when bit 7 of A is the same as bit 7 of B, but bit 7 of A is different to bit 7 of sum. Now, overflow for subtraction is different, and I'll discuss that a bit later. The final flag that we need to worry about is the decimal adjust flag. I'll look at decimal adjust in a lot more detail in another video later on. Let's look at these three add instructions in the 6502 add zero page, add immediate, and add absolute. Here we can see an add instruction being executed from memory. In immediate mode, the next address is fetched, and that's fed straight into the adder. We add these instructions to first pass decode, then second pass decode. We read the value of the B register from main memory. Then we've actually got to decide what sort of add we want to do. And there are four options, add with no carry, add with carry, add with decimal adjust, and add with decimal adjust and carry. First thing we want to do is add A with B. We can then compute carry out and overflow. We write the lower eight bits of our result back into A. Then we update negative and zero as we've done before. Add with carry is almost identical, except this time temporary is A plus B plus one. The rest is just the same as before. I'll leave the details of add decimal and add carry to the Turing to von Neumann playlist where I build an ALU. Back to our state machine, we add these instructions as arcs out of rule 28, and again out of rule 29. Next, we want a separate rule that reads the status register and decides whether to do an add, add with carry, add decimal, or add decimal with carry. We also use this as an opportunity to initiate our main memory read into the B register. I quote this quite often, but Turing did write, the scan symbol is the only one of which the machine is, so to speak, directly aware. However, by altering its M configuration, the machine can effectively remember some of the symbols which it has seen previously. In our case, we want to convert the value in the B register into a rule number. So rules 3068 through 3323 represent all the values that B can take. Then in each of these rules, we have another 256 arcs for all the values that A can take. And it's on these arcs that we write back a pre-computed value of A plus B into the A register. Then finally, we update the negative, zero, carry, and overflow flags. Add with carry is essentially the same, but it requires another 257 rules. And it also contains the pre-computed values of A plus B plus one. Add decimal and add decimal with carry setter of a similar form. We'll discuss how we come up with the pre-computed values in a later video. The subtract command on the 6502 is a bit unusual. It's actually subtract memory from accumulator with borrow, and they define it as accumulator minus memory minus the inverse of carry. So that's minus zero or minus one, and the result goes back into A. In our case, the value in the memory is preloaded into B, so that means that the result is A register minus B register minus not carry. But we can change this minus B register into the negation of B register plus one. So we end up with A register plus the negation of B register plus one minus not carry. Now, if we think about it and carry zero, then one minus not carry is one minus one, which is zero. But if carry is equal to one, then it's 1 minus 0, which is equal to 1. So 1 minus not carry is just the same as carry. On the 6502, this means that to do a subtraction, we negate the value of B and then just treat it as an addition. If we zoom in on the 6502 design, we can actually see these inverters as an input to the B register. 
that negates the value of B and just treats it as a normal addition. Let's look at the SBC instruction for zero page, immediate and absolute addressing modes. We add them to first pass and second pass decode. Then you'll notice that we actually negate the value read from memory before we write it into the B register. We read the status register and either call add, add with carry, subtract decimal, and subtract decimal with carry. The way we compute overflow is a little different for subtraction versus addition. A positive number minus a positive number is always within range. A negative number minus a negative number is also always within range. The problem is if we subtract a negative number from a positive number, or subtract a positive number from a negative number. This time, overflow occurs when A7 does not equal B7, and A7 does not equal some bit 7. Subtraction is basically an addition where we negate the value of B first. We initiate the read straight out of rule 29, and we have this extra step of negating B before we go into the add. We also need special state machines for subtract decimal and subtract decimal with carry. Compare is essentially the same as subtract with carry set, but this time we discard the result and only use the flags. First we negate B, then do an add with carry, but here's the tricky bit. Instead of writing the result back into A, we just write the original value back into A. Whatever was in the B register gets discarded at the end of the instruction. It also turns out we can do the same with the index X register and the index Y register. I discussed increment in the index register video, but there's another instruction called INC which operates on a memory location. It reads a value in memory, adds one, and writes it back to memory. If we look at these increment instructions, we add them to first pass decode, second pass decode, and we can effectively implement it with one rule. We just read the value in B and write back the value plus one. Then we just do a main memory write from the B register, remembering that the memory address registers should be unchanged. After that, we just update the flags appropriately. As you can see here, decrement is very similar to increment. Many of these ALU operations require 257 rules each. So let's see how much that uses overall. The ALU operations start at rule 2023 and go through to 5380 for a total of 3357 rules. Each rule has 256 symbols. So this is going to require a total of 860,000 addresses. Each address in the ROM is 4 bytes wide, so this is a total of about 3.5 megabytes. The different addressing modes also use arithmetic. They start at rule 326 and go through to rule 2008. This gives us 1682 rules, each with 256 symbols. This is 430,000 ROM locations, which is about 1.7 megabytes. So doing these ALU operations as lookup tables has cost us about 5.2 megabytes all up. In the Turing to von Neumann playlist, we put a real ALU in place and we'll see how much memory it saves us. This video is coming soon, so don't forget to like, share, subscribe.